So I started this series last Sunday, and I told you that every Sunday I would have a wonderfully delightful, fun, entertaining friend quiz to start the sermon off. So today I have the man's best friend edition of the quiz. We have some famous friendships between man and man's best friend, which is what? A dog, all right? So, got some pictures here. Put the first one up there. So, I'm going to ask you a question and you see if you can answer it. This is a 1989 buddy cop movie starring Tom Hanks and Beasley the dog is his real name. Plays Tom Hanks' partner with a really bad saliva problem. But um, what is the name of the dog in the movie? Who knows? Hooch. Everybody knows that, all right? Uh, Next one. If ever there was a bond between man and his best friend, it's right there. Right, Scooby and Shaggy. And uh, they, along with their meddlesome team, foiled many a spooky plot. In the cartoon, who was the voice of Shaggy? Anybody know? Who's, I heard it, I think. No, you don't count. Somebody, somebody do something with her. Casey Kasem, there you go. Casey Kasem from America's Top 40 for those of you who are old like me. All right, the next one. This is an oldie but a goodie. Uh, This is a story, 1950 show called Lassie about a boy and his best friend dog. His his best friend, the dog Lassie. But what is the boy's name? Does anybody know? (laughs) It's a lot of, a lot of old people here. I I don't want to say it, but thank you, right? This next one, this movie came out about 10 years ago based on a book of the same name, A Tearjerker, about an irascible, ill-behaved dog. What is the name of the movie in the book? Marley and Me, right? Then this one, I had to put this in. This is my all-time favorite sitcom, Frasier. Kelsey Grammer plays Frasier, who opens his home to his father, Martin, and Martin's best friend, the dog, Eddie, for all the pot, for all the marbles, for, for... Well, really nothing, but what kind of dog is Eddie? Who knows? Jack Russell. Jack Russell Terrier. There you go. And then this next one is kind of a bonus round. So, yeah. I don't have a question. I just saw it and thought it was funny. So that's, like, that is the funniest dog picture I ever saw. But uh, we are, uh, we're going to continue this series on friendship um, I've, I've told this story before, but I've never told this side of it. When I went to Indiana University as a freshman in college, I was a freshman. I was going there ready to, like, partay, man. And I didn't pick a roommate, though. So I was excited to see who my roommate would be when I moved into the dorm. And I got there a, he- a day ahead of my roommate. And when I walked into my dorm room at IU, uh, painted in big red letters across the back of the wall where the, was the word Budweiser. And I thought, yeah, party, man, Budweiser, all right. I assumed that my roommate had, had done that, but he didn't, wasn't there yet. So I didn't know who he would be. So the next day, my roommate, and I'm a freshman, my roommate arrives the next day, and I learned that I was roommates with a, like, I'm a freshman, stupid in the brain, ready to think I'm ready to party, and my, my roommate is a senior, computer science major, a senior who lived who who, all four years of his college career at IU lived in that same dorm room right and I thought to myself like you got to know like what kind of what kind of person lives in the same dorm room his entire college life and he's a he's a senior and Surprise, surprise, he did not paint the word Budweiser on the wall, right? Somebody did that during summer school, evidently. But um, I thought, oh, man, come on. What a drag this guy's going to be. Um, it was like literally, and Jeff, if you're watching, I don't think you do, but I, I love you, but this is the truth. I felt like I had stepped into the set of Big Bang Theory. I mean, seriously. You know, this guy was a computer geek all the way. And, um, you, know, the, you know, if you've been to college, you know the worst possible thing you can do to, to, to like, you're the biggest loser in the world is to live in the dorms your entire four years of college. Like, nobody does that. Like, I tried to get Becca to do that, and she just looked at me like, Dad, I'm not doing that. Like, I'm not going to go back to the dorms. You can't force me. And I said, well, it's got to be better than living here at home like you've done for the last two years in COVID. But anyway, but let me tell you, as unlikely 
as it seemed at first. Jeff and I became really, really good friends. And as you know, if you've heard me tell the story, I was a couple of months there and decided that God was pursuing me. I became a Christian. And, and you see, God knew exactly who I needed to be roommates with. I mean, for me to be roommates as a freshman with a senior who's a Christian, who has a very calming, stabilizing influence on me, was absolutely amazing. And he and his girlfriend were great comfort to me and, and helped me when I, be, when I started becoming a Christian and when I was getting harassed by guys on my floor. And it was just like God knew exactly that I needed this very, very unlikely roommate who also became a very unlikely friend. We want to look at today two ladies in the Old Testament who became close friends, even though their, their close friendship was pretty unlikely. We're going to be talking about Naomi and Ruth in the, in the Old Testament book of Ruth. Now, Naomi, the thing that makes it so unlikely is that Naomi was Ruth's mother-in-law. Now, you've probably heard, as I have, all the, all the mother-in-law jokes and uh, it's kind of cliche, although I got to be honest with you, I've never been able to relate to mother-in-law jokes. I was fortunate to have had the best mother-in-law there ever was. And of course, she was fortunate enough to have the best son-in-law there ever was. And I'm not talking about my brother-in-law, Mark. I'm not talking about you, friend. It's me. But I just could not ever relate to some of these jokes. We've heard them, right? These mother-in-law jokes, like... Like Adam and Eve, they were the happiest and luckiest couple in the world because neither of them had, had a mother-in-law, right? Or like the two guys that were sitting in the bar and one guy says to his friend, hey, my mother-in-law is an angel. To which his friend replied, well, you're lucky. Mine's still alive. So like I could never, like, I could never relate to, to all of these jokes and I have so many more, but I'll stop there. So this is an unlikely friendship between Ruth and Naomi because of this in-law dynamic, but also because Ruth, Ruth was not an Israelite. She was from Moab. She wasn't Jewish. And, and the, the, the Moabite nation and the Israelites, they did not like each other. And, and the, the Moabites were a constant problem with the, with the Jewish people. But their friendship... Ruth and Naomi's friendship, as it turned out, was exactly what each one of them needed for what they were going through and going to go through in life. God knew that they would need each other when they both experienced profound grief in their life and the death of her husband with, with, um, and, and the death of, of, of Naomi's added grief of losing her sons. And so their friendship was forged in the, in the fire of adversity and it sustained them. Now, we're going to be talking about, about their friendship from the standpoint of grief. But, you know, there's, a, there's such a thing called the scale of life stressors. And it kind of rates on there everything that can happen to us in our life in, in order of, like, what causes the most stress. And, and the death of a spouse, as many of you know, causes the most stress. And then there are things also on there like major job upheavals or job losses or having to move or major illnesses or financial problems. There's a whole list of things. And I was looking down through that list. And then we're going to be talking about grief in terms of the death of, of, that they experience. We need to understand that every, there, there are lots of different kinds of grief. And as I looked at that list of, of, of stressors, it occurred to me that probably everybody over the last year and a half or a couple of years, everybody probably has experienced one of these major life-changing things. And you know, grief accompanies not just death, but it also accompanies a lot of other things that happen to us. And so I think that we'll see as we go through this, that this is something that can help us all. But their friendship was forged in this, in this adversity, and it sustained them. And I want to look at a couple different areas. The first area I want us to see is the bitterness. Is the bitterness that, that, that was experienced. And so we're going to set up the story. I'd really like for you to turn to it in your Bibles. I'll have just a couple of the verses I'm referencing on the screen. But in Ruth chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. Now Ruth is only four chapters long. But to really understand what's going on, we need to read these, these verses. And so it begins, In the days when the judges ruled... There was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of their two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab, and they lived there. 
And so right here we see, you know, they're, they're going through a major life change and a major stress themselves. And you kind of see this is sort of the typical family, a mother and a father and, and their two boys. And all of a sudden, there's a severe famine come on the scene. And they're forced to go to a country because, because there was food there that they really didn't want to go to. As I said, Moabite country oppressed Israel. But this famine must have been so severe that they had to go to this foreign territory in order just to be able to put food on the table. But when they go there, tragedy strikes, as you, if, you, if you've read the story. Naomi's husband dies. Now, Naomi's sons had married two women from Moab, and so she still had now at least her two sons and, and her two daughters-in-law. But then after a few short years, both of her sons died. So this is a woman in intense grief, three losses in that amount of time, in addition to everything else that they had to deal with. Now, <clears throat> I think it's, it's really, really tough, probably really impossible for, for most of us, and especially for me, to imagine the pain that she experienced in her loss. But, but many of you do know, many of you have been there, and maybe... Maybe you have felt at one point, whether it's that cause or, or another one of these stress events that you might, might have felt what Naomi did. And so in, in Ruth chapter 1 verses 20 and 21, listen to what Naomi says out of her anger and out of her grief. Some people call her Naomi and then she says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. That's what Mara means. I went away full, she says. But the Lord has brought me back empty. Why, why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. And it is, it is natural and it's normal. And in fact, it happens most of the time to, to blame God or, or at least to question God's wisdom when, when we go through any kind of tragedy or pain. And it's really kind of part of the process. Many, many years ago, there was a, a lady who studied these things named Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and she came up with what's commonly known as the five stages of grief. And most everybody passes through these stages at one point in the process. But anger, anger certainly is, is I, I don't know if it's the first or the second, I don't remember. But Naomi was angry. But thankfully, she had this faithful friend of all people, her daughter-in-law, Ruth, who stood by her side when she herself was grieving. So she experienced this, this, this blessing of having a faithful friend. And as we move through the story, that's kind of the sort of the second movement. If, if this is a story in three movements, four chapters, but three movements, this will be the second one where we see how incredibly faithful Ruth is in this process. Now, both of them, both of them are grieving Naomi had lost her husband and two sons. Ruth had lost her husband. And after all of this has taken place in the first chapter, we read that Naomi decides she wants to go back home. She wants to go back home to her homeland. The famine there is over. And so she's going to leave Moab. She's going to go back to Bethlehem. Now notice that both of her daughters-in-law, when, when, when Naomi announces this, hey, I'm going home, both of them say, well, let us go with you. We'll go with you. You can't go there by yourself. And Naomi says to both of them, no, it's not necessary. You don't need to do that. That's not your homeland. You stay here. And finally, one of them, Orpah, says, okay, well, I'll stay here in Moab. But Ruth doesn't do that. Ruth, Ruth clings to her. And in verses 1, chapter 1, verse 16 through 18, though she had no moral or legal obligation to do this, she decides to go with her mother-in-law. But it's what she says and how she says it that is so striking. And at this point, Ruth says to Naomi one of the most beautiful, well-known, well-loved passages of the entire Old Testament. And Ruth said to Naomi, don't urge me to leave you. Or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. And then she says, may the, may the Lord deal ever so severely with me if even death separates you and me. I 
Many of you know I've said I'm not really that crazy about the King James Version for a lot of reasons, but I love the way that it puts this. It just sounds so beautiful. In the King James Version it says, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and, my, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there I will be buried." Oftentimes, we'll hear this passage at, at weddings, right? And it's usually said in the King James Version. And it's always interesting to me when people choose to have this read at their wedding because, because really it's, it's, you know, this, this isn't said in the context of a man and a woman in a wedding. It's said in the context of a mother-in-law and her, and her daughter-in-law. And so really, if we're going to be accurate on our weddings and use that passage, at one point what would happen or what should happen is the bride should turn around and then say to the mother-in-law, where you go, I will go. And where you, like, I don't, I don't see that happening though. But really, that's what ought to happen, right? Well, Ruth gave up three different things when she made, the, when she made this commitment to go, to go back with Naomi. First of all, Ruth gave up her homeland and that was, that was really hard, especially for women to do. But she gave up her homeland. She, she also gave up her religion, left her religion. You see, in Moab, they, they weren't Jewish. They weren't Israelites. They didn't have just one God, but they had many, many gods that they believed in. But it's interesting what Ruth said to Naomi. She said, your God will be my God. I, I'm going to go with you, and I'm going to be all in, and your God will be my God. So there was this spiritual commitment and a change of her religious convictions that was taking place in this unlikely friendship. The third thing that Ruth gave up was that she gave up her security. She left her homeland. She left her friends. She left her family. She basically cut herself off from her people. But she did this because she was an amazing friend to her mother-in-law, Naomi. Now, like I said, probably everybody in this room most people, anyway, these last couple years have experienced somewhat of, of the loss of either security or health or loved ones or, or job situations or, or whatever it might be. And what we need are, when we go through times like that are faithful people who will stick with us no matter what. There's the, a Bible verse that says, there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. So how do we do that? How do we, how do we, how are we good friends for people who are grieving or going through horrible situations? What can we do? I want to give you just a couple of suggestions. I think the first thing that we can do to be good friends to people in this situation is, is to weep with them, to actually shed tears with them. There were two women, they were talking about, about another lady. And, and the one woman said to the woman she was talking to, well, you must be, you must be pretty good friends with this other person that they were both talking about. And the lady said, no, not really. She said, we're not friends. We're just acquaintances. You see, she said, we haven't yet cried together. And I think there's something true that abiding friendships are formed more out of tears than of laughter. So we need to not be afraid to weep with people. Jesus did this. We're told in the Bible, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And so, so that is something that... That brings great comfort to other people when we do that. Uh, another thing is just simply to be there and listen. To be there and listen. I think sometimes we're afraid to approach people when we know they've gone through some traumatic experience or they're going through it because we, we don't know what to say. And we don't want to say the wrong thing. And we don't want to say something stupid. And trust me, as well as intentioned as they might be, there are a lot of stupid things that are said to people uh, who are hurting. And, and so maybe if, it would be better if we just were more concerned about listening than what we might say to them. Just to be there. And listen, Galatians 6, 2 says, carry each other's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. That's kind of a, a strange verse, but that's what it says. We, we fulfill the law of Christ when we are there for one another. When we do speak, however, I would say, choose our words carefully. Weep with them, be there and listen to them, but then also choose our words carefully. I think the best thing that we can do most of the time and what I try to do is to let that person lead the conversation. I don't know how many times I've been in hospital rooms 
And uh, maybe I got there after the family or maybe some of the family members came after I was already there. And, uh, but the person, especially depending on what stage they're in of life, they want to they they talk about death. And I don't know how many times the family, because they were uncomfortable with this, said, no, don't, don't talk like that. You're going to be fine. You're going to get better. You're going to get out of here soon. And well, that may have made them feel better, but that's the person is ready to talk about eternity and about, and about death. Let, let them lead the conversation where they want it to go. Uh, obviously, it goes without saying that we just need to be supportive, generally supportive. I don't know how many times I've had people say to me, Chris, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know what I'd have done without, without my church family. I don't know what I'd have done without all the cards and the prayers and the meals and, and people to watch the kids and all these things that people that went an extra mile that's being supportive. Ruth and Naomi were supportive of each other. And when one was strong, the other was weak. When one needed shoring up, the other person would be strong. And they supported one another. They supported one another. Now here I'm going to I'm going to tell a story that shows how old I am now that I'm 55, right? Some of you remember Paul Harvey. Does anybody else remember Paul Harvey? Or is it, thank you, okay. Like, young people are like, how old is that guy? Like, what is he talking about? I love to, I love to, to used to love to listen to Paul Harvey on the radio uh, when he would tell the rest of the story, he would say. Heard him tell one day about a couple, or an older man, who uh, was coming through the checkout line in the grocery store and had just a couple items with him. But standing in front of him in line was, was a young lady. Um, and, and, and she kept looking back at him. And she was really pretty. And so at first he was kind of flattered by it, but then he came to his senses and was like, why, did, why does she keep looking back at me? And finally she looked back at, back at him one more time and she kind of had a tear in her eye, he could tell. And she said, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to stare at you. She said, but... She said, but you just, you just look so much like my grandfather. And you see, he died recently, and, and I miss him so much. Well, the, the gentleman was kind of sympathetic, and he said, I'm, I'm really sorry about that, miss. He said, I know how that hurts. He said, is there, is, I, is there anything that I can do for you to help you out? And she said, no, not really. And then she turned around. But then she turned back around. And she said, you know what? There is, there is something that you could do. It might sound kind of weird, but before my grandfather died, we never had the chance to say goodbye. She said, I, I know this is crazy, but as I walk out of the grocery store, would you just say, would you just say to me, goodbye, sweetheart? That's what, he, that's what he used to call me. Well, the man was obviously kind of touched by it. He said, you know, I'd be honored to do that. So the young lady got her groceries and she put them in the cart. And as she walked out, he waved at her and he said, goodbye, sweetheart. And she waved at him and... She said, goodbye, goodbye, Grandpa. He kind of had a tear in his eye. She had a tear in her eye. Everybody in Kroger was watching this drama unfold, and it was, and it was very touching. And then the man turned back to, toward the checkout clerk to pay for his groceries, and the checkout clerk said, okay, that'll be $127. He said, well, I only got two items. The clerk said, well, yeah, but your granddaughter said that you are going to pay for hers. And so, I mean... <laughs> Some people are just so ruthless, aren't they? I mean, it's just, it's just. Uh... You see, genuine, genuine grief needs a shoulder to cry on more than it needs a free handout. And again, most people tell me that the visitation and the funeral, uh, people minister to them and, and, and it's easiest, but the toughest times the toughest times, no matter what we're going through, whatever traumatic experience, are the days after. Or when everybody else has gone back to life and, and, and you're alone there with your thoughts. Those are the times to be supportive and to call and send a letter or call and say, hey, I was just thinking about this memory or whatever. And especially maybe like on the first anniversary of a major life event, like call them and reach out to them. That is, that is being a supportive friend. It is so hard for people. So hard for people who have experienced whatever it might be, some life-shaking event. One of the hardest things is to see people all around them just kind of going about their life unaware of the tragedy that they were dealing with in their own. And so just, just remembering and being supportive. But I would say that I think this story more than anything 
points to the fact that in these times, we can find the comfort of God. The comfort of God. You might be grieving over something that happened last week or last month or last year or whenever it might be. But God never ever forgets. And I want to kind of just, just point out, I think, uh, a, a few steps to, to help us when we go through some of these situations, whatever it might be. And you might want to jot them down. I'm not going to put them up on the screen. But the first one primarily, and this is the one that's kind of hardest because we might be ex- feeling some, some anger, but is to realize that God understands your pain. God understands your pain. Who better to comfort you than God, than the one who made you? And it may not seem like it at the time. People might try to tell you this. Well-meaning pastors may try to tell you this. And, there will, and maybe it, it doesn't land very well because uh, you're still in pain. But, but understand that God knows your pain. I love what a guy, Doug Manning, Doug Manning once wrote this. And I don't remember where I saw this, but I've always remember it. That grief is like peeling an onion. It comes off one layer at a time. And it makes you cry a lot. And I like that analogy because everybody goes through grief in their own unique way. If I, if I handed out onions to you here today, everybody would have a different onion. No two onions would be alike. No two of us would peel the onion in the same way. Grief is as unique to individuals as a fingerprint. And man, when we don't understand that, it can cause problems. When we expect each other to process grief and go through it in the same way that we do, we're just asking for problems and we don't respect the fact that we all grieve differently and maybe this person does understand it doesn't understand it but I tell you what God does God does but but because of that ask God to turn your sorrow into joy John chapter 16 verse 20 Jesus says you will you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices you will grieve but your grief will turn into joy See, this is our great hope as Christians. This is why, <laughs> this is why when things kind of get turned upside down in our world or your world or the entire world, this is why, this is why we stay plugged into our faith in God. This is why we stay plugged in to our church family. Because we need to understand that this is our great hope as Christians. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. He said, now I don't want you to grieve as people who don't have any hope. For we have hope. We believe in the resurrection. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And we believe that he's going to come again with all those who have gone on before us. We, we, don't, we don't grieve as people who have no hope, he says. Ask God. Ask God during these times. To turn your sorrow into hope and joy. Another thing you can do, and this probably goes without saying, is just, just review positive memories of, of the one that you lost or whatever it might be situation. Remember what, was li- what life was like before that. And this is where I love another thing that the Apostle Paul writes. At the very end of the book of Philippians, he's writing this from jail. This is a great... The great book where he says, don't worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then he says this, I love this passage. He says, also, finally, brothers and sisters, he says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about these things. Think about positive things. And then also return to worshiping God. Return to worshiping God. I hear it time and time again. Again, somebody will pass away uh, maybe on a Saturday or later in the week and then I'll look out on Sunday and their family or husband or wife or whoever will be there and I'll, I'll go up to them, I'll say, oh, I'm so glad you're here, but you know, everybody would have understand if you, you know, if you just didn't feel like you could come today and, and without a doubt, they always say, I, I could not not be here. I have to be here. This is the only thing that keeps me going, being with my church family, worshiping God. Because the worship of God And the body of Christ has the ability to help us heal. Help us heal these places of deep hurt inside of us. King David, 
When King David's son died, he went into the temple and he worshiped. And his friends around him said, David, what are you doing? And David said, I've got to, I've got to go worship. And they said, David said this, he said, he cannot come back to me, but I can go to him. And it says that he got up, cleaned himself up, and he went to the temple and he worshiped. And that is really where, where the comfort comes when we worship God. When we worship God, hopefully, we get lost in the realization and the fact that this life, with all of its hurts, as well as its joys, this life is really not what it's all about. And that there waits for us a better, a better place. One of the things that I think, that I know helps when we're, when we're struggling with, with grief or turmoil or whatever it is, is to at some point respond to it by ministering to others. By ministering to others who might be going through the same thing. Um, you, you may not even be through the whole process yourself. But you can help people, tell them what to expect, point them in the direction of Christ. And please understand that our pain becomes part of our personal testimony. Our pain affects us, shapes us, forges us more than anything else in life. And God wants to use that. It may not, it may not be that much of a comfort at the time. But I, I think you would see that, that if you allow God to use that in your life to help others, it would help you as well. And so again, the Apostle Paul, he was such a smart guy. He said in 2 Corinthians 1.3, he said, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Another challenge is to just kind of regroup and start living your life again. Apostle Paul says, forgetting what is behind, I strain toward what is ahead. And moving on with life, whatever, whatever it might be that has, has, has caused this turmoil in your life, moving past it is so essential. But I tell you, it's hard to do. It's hard to do. I'm, I'm one who, I kind of tend to live more in the past I'm not proud of it. It's just the way I'm wired. It's the way I am. It's not good. I try to overcome it. But I, I am one that tends to kind of live in the past and rehearse things in my mind, grievances and what, what somebody said or did or, or whatever. In fact, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what it is right now. I will someday. I will someday. But um, I'm, even now as I speak, I'm having a hard time moving on uh, over something that was done to me just a little, just a little while ago by our, our sound team back there. And I just want to, I just want to, I just want to, I want you to know, but really I want them to know that I don't forget anything. <laughs> that I live in the past. And it's coming, my friends. It's coming. I don't know what, when. <laughs> but, but it, oh, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> Well, we need to move on. We need to move on with life, resume our life. But the most important thing, obviously, is rely, rely on the Lord to get you through. Rely on the Lord to get you through. Our, fr our friends can be great helps to us, but only, listen, only, only God, because God is a supernatural God. Only God can truly, truly heal our hurts. I, I just, I came across this verse um, a couple years ago when I was getting ready for a funeral and it just really struck me and I've used it almost in every funeral that I've done since. But, but in Psalm 56, 8, King David prays this to the Lord and he says, Lord, you, you have seen me tossing and turning through the night, but you have collected my tears and you have preserved them in your bottle. You have recorded everyone in your book. And of course he's speaking metaphorically, but this idea of God taking our tears and keeping them in bottles and never, like never forgetting the things that we go through. I think that's an amazing thought. It's an amazing truth. Some of you have probably filled up a bottle uh, in heaven, a couple bottles maybe with your tears. Others of you feel like maybe you've you filled up a swimming pool with yours. You don't think sometimes, we don't think that we could cry another tear even if we had to. But God has designed us in such a way that we've got to get to the point where we understand he is really ultimately the only one who can provide us the comfort that we need. That's why I really, really ache sometimes for people, and this is pretty common, 
People sometimes, they go through tragic, horrible events and they, and they quit coming to church. They, and I understand it. They're upset. They don't know. But, but they're running from the only one that can really heal them. And, and that's, that's tragic because we need to understand that that is the case. That's why Jesus says in John 16, he says, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. Jesus said, because I have overcome the world. You see, when we trust our pain and our grief to God, the God who, who walked out of his own tomb, the God who conquered death so that we can live forever, that's really what we need. That's really what we need. I love, I love the end of the story of Ruth. Because Ruth, even through her heartache and grief of losing her husband, she, she gets married. She moves on with life. She gets married to a guy named Boaz. And, and this was, as we find out, part of God's plan for her. And Boaz was what was called her kinsman redeemer. And according to Old Testament law, he redeems her life by marrying her. God grants them a son. And the son is named Obed. But it's interesting, though, at the end of chapter 4 of the book of Ruth, verses 16 and 17, not only is there a transformation that takes place in the life of Ruth through her marriage and, and through this child, but also one in the life of Naomi. If you recall before, Naomi said, hey, don't call me Naomi. Why don't you just call me Mara, which means bitter. Well, now here she is at the end of the story. She's holding that grandchild in her lap. And in verse 17, the women living there said, Naomi has a son. And you notice what isn't written there. Now it's her grandson, but they say Naomi has a son. But you see what's not there. Naomi doesn't correct them. Naomi doesn't say, hey, remember? Remember I told you a while ago, don't call me that. My name is Mara now. Because, because life has been bitter to me. No, she doesn't correct them. Because now she understands and God has restored her. You see, weeping, weeping lasts for a night, but joy comes in the morning. That night lasted for over 10 years for Naomi. But now she was in a time of joy. Morning had come. You see, God does heal our hurts. God can heal our broken hearts if we will, if we will just give him all the pieces of it. If we will say, Lord, I just lay this down at the foot of the cross. God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I'm, I'm crying. I'm uncomfortable. I need your help, Lord. I, don't, I can't even think straight, Lord. But would you just help me get through today? And you know, God promises to help us. God promises to heal us in his way, in his time. Doesn't, doesn't make all the hurt and the pain go away all the time. Sometimes it, it's still there. It's not erased, but it can be redeemed. It can be repurposed by God who holds us in his hands. By this God who collects our tears in, in, the bo in his bottle. This God of whom Isaiah says he has the, our names inscribed on the palms of his hands. See, because there's, there's another layer to the story, which I really haven't touched on here or gotten into. But it's the fact that this incredibly, this unlikely friendship between a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law is part of a, of, of a larger story that involves another person. See, Ruth, the Moabite woman, went on to marry a man named Boaz. And as you see at the end of this book of Ruth, it, it talks about Obed and then, and then Jesse, King David. Uh, uh, Jesse, father of King David. But if you turn to Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy of Jesus, you find these words. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. And then if you keep reading on through that lineage, you see that eventually it leads to Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. You see, this is a story that while it was playing out in painful events on earth, this was a story that in the upper, in the upper realms, the upper story we call it, God was working in such a way so that each one of us could know personally his love for us because it led to Jesus Christ. Jesus told the disciples one day, I call you, I call you my friends. And this Jesus says to us as well, come to me all who are weary and heavy burdened and I will, I will give you rest for your souls. And he is a friend who never disappoints He's a friend who's promised never to leave us or forsake us. 
And he is a friend, if you do not know him personally, who wants you to accept him into your life as your Lord, as your Savior, so that he can call you his friend.